earlier this week, a federal court dismissed all challenges to the Texas Heartbeat Act by rule, a ru ruling that uh, because state officials aren't responsible for enforcing the Texas Heartbeat Act, abortion companies are unable to sue the state. And the court then provided yet another win for the pro-life movement. This comes as we await the Supreme Court's ruling in the case of Dobbs versus the Jackson Women's Health Organization out of Mississippi. Joining me now to talk about this is the legal mind who laid the groundwork for Texas's Heartbeat Act and provided the roadmap for other states to follow. Jonathan Mitchell, he is the former Solicitor General of the Lone Star State, and he has served on the faculties of Stanford Law School, the University of Texas School of Law, the George Mason University School of Law, and the University of Chicago School of Law. And he has argued five cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, including the Heartbeat Act. Jonathan, welcome to Washington Watch. Thanks for having me, Tony. Good to be with you. Well, first, uh, let me start with this. Your reaction to the federal court's dismissal this week of all challenges to the Heartbeat Act? It was expected, you know, because the Supreme Court of the United States and the Supreme Court of Texas together have already held that there's no one left for the abortion providers to sue. So this ruling we got from the Fifth Circuit earlier this week was just a formality. And in terms of my reaction, I think it shows that we know this tactic works and any state can restrict abortion now as it sees fit without waiting for the Supreme Court to overrule Roe against Wade. All they have to do is copy what Texas did. We have the blueprint. All right, I, I, I gotta step back for just a moment, Jonathan, and ask you this question. I mean, we're, we're nearly 50 years to, at the decision of Roe v. Wade. How did you uh, come about taking this approach? We needed to try a different approach to what we had been doing before. And what happens under the undue burden standard that the Supreme Court invented, it's a highly vague test. It's hard to predict how a Supreme Court will rule when you enact legislation. And what we had been doing in the past was enacting statutes, not knowing whether they would ultimately hold up in court, waiting for the pro-abortion groups to sue the state officials in order to get an injunction, and then have to pay out millions of dollars in attorney's fees if we guessed wrong. We had to change the tactics that we were using and do more to just box out the federal judiciary from even having jurisdiction to consider the cases, and that's what Texas did. Now, Jonathan, is this similar to what we saw back in the 80s? We saw uh, a, a little bit of an attempt, at, I don't think it worked, to go after abortion for liability for committing abortions. We saw for a while that effort was used more in the civil courts, um, mm -hmm. but it never caught traction. What made this different? The difference here is that they're expanding the scope of potential plaintiffs by allowing any person to sue, essentially taking away the state's enforcement power and giving it to private citizens rather than putting it in the hands of state officials. And by structuring the law this way, there's no way for the abortion providers to come into federal court and challenge the statute pre-enforcement because they have to wait for someone to sue them first and then assert whatever constitutional claims they want to make in a defensive posture. So the difference here is that the statute has taken away affirmatively the authority of state officials to enforce the act and given that power instead to the private citizenry. And there's no way for the abortion providers to know in advance who's going to sue them. So that's why they can't challenge the statute in court pre-enforcement. So we're at a point now, the court has dismissed the challenges, but do you anticipate any other challenges from different angles coming at this law in the days and weeks ahead? There are some still challenges pending in federal court and state court, but they don't involve claims for statewide relief. They're individual plaintiffs suing individual defendants. So even if those lawsuits were successful from the standpoint of the abortion providers, they're not going to be able to get a statewide injunction that stops the law from being enforced. And that's really what they need if they want the abortion clinics to start reopening and providing post-heartbeat abortions again. They don't really have any roadmap right now to get to that result, given what happened to the Supreme Court. Now, from a cultural standpoint, and I'm not speaking it to, to it from a legal standpoint, I'm going to let you do that, but I would think this really changes the landscape for the Supreme Court as they consider the Dobbs case. I think this sets the stage where the court has to take action to, to push this back to the states. It already has been pushed back to the states because Texas's law has shown that states already can get around Roe against Wade simply by adopting this tactic. So whether the Supreme Court overrules Roe and Dobbs becomes less significant because Texas and later today, Oklahoma, they've just recently passed a similar law that's enforced through private citizen suits. 
both of these states have shown other states how they can get around Roe without waiting for the Supreme Court to overrule it. So if Dobbs does overrule Roe against Wade, that will allow states to reinstate their traditional abortion prohibitions that are enforced through criminal law, through conventional public enforcement. But the, the key point to keep in mind is that right now, states have the ability to restrict abortion in any matter they see fit simply by using this enforcement tactic through private civil lawsuits rather than conventional public enforcement by state officials. Well, Jonathan, I think it's brilliant. Um, just I've mean, got 30 seconds left, but do you see this model being used for other aspects of, of uh, law? We'll have to see whether it can go outside the abortion context. It's hard to know because you always have to motivate a legislature to enact a law like this. Legislators are politicians. They respond to political incentives. There were very strong incentives in a state like Texas to enact this law to circumvent Roe against Wade because that decision is not held in very high regard by the Texas legislators. It's hard for me to imagine other Supreme Court decisions that provoke the same type of opposition as Roe. So I'm not expecting this to be used widely outside the abortion context, but it's possible it will if there's future Supreme Court decisions that engender similar type of opposition that Roe against Wade did. All right, uh, Jonathan Mitchell, again, tremendous job. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I uh, appreciate your work Thanks, upholding Tony. the sanctity of human life. Thank you. All right, up next, folks.